Okay, so um, good evening, afternoon, good morning from uh, where you are. Uh, nice to see you all again in this uh, webinar, in the webinar series in our Transpath Planning project. And today we have uh, Charlene Gomez uh, of IHC Delft, who is going to share her knowledge and experience with us on transdisciplinary approaches to problem diagnose very urban water issues and uh, the insights from her research in Southeast Asia. Um, all said, more than enough, I think. So I see uh, Charlene, you are also ready. Yes. So please. Take Thank you. Yeah. And I'm um, looking forward to your story. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah. So, as Yap suggested today, I just want to walk you through um, two projects that I have been involved in in peri urban South Asia. And they were both transdisciplinary projects. Um, and I want to talk, focus more on the problem diagnosis stages of these projects in terms of how they were set up and some of the uh, challenges and strengths in the way that we approach this, uh, because I know that all of the other TransPath project nodes are at similar stages. So I thought it's a nice time to share insights or uh, lessons learned from these ones. Okay, so just to set the stage, I am talking today about projects in peri-urban South Asia. And so to give you a little bit of insight as to what peri-urban areas are, uh, some of you might already be very familiar with them, but they are very close to uh, expanding cities. And these are very dynamic areas. They are always changing in population, economic activities, land use changes. Um, and as a result, this transformation process is ongoing. Um, they are also very heterogeneous in terms of their social composition, which means that, <clears throat> sorry, water needs are constantly evolving as well during the transformation process. And one unique thing that is very relevant for the two projects I'm gonna discuss is that these communities are largely isolated from decision-making arenas. So that makes, has some impact as to the voice that they have in uh, navigating these transformations and dealing with water-related challenges as they come up. So, the peri-urban transformation has um, also shown to cause a variety of issues on local water resources, which includes access issues to um, water infrastructure, also competition over water resources from industries, from cities, but also competition between different kinds of water users within the community, uh, contamination, both of surface and groundwater, and in parts of South Asia that I will discuss today, there's a lot of arsenic, iron, salinity issues. Um, there's also overexploitation, And as a result of all of these pressures, conflicts have also arisen between different water users over time. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll take you through the first project uh, that I did um, actually as part of my PhD when I was at TU Delft. So this was called the Shifting Grounds Project. Um, which was looking at institutional transformation, enhancing knowledge and capacity to manage groundwater issues in the peri-urban Ganges Delta. So as part of this project, the main objective was to build knowledge and capacity among local actors to support a transformation process within these um, peri-urban Delta communities in both Bangladesh and India. Um, and in terms of the transformation here, what we were trying to achieve was a pro poor sustainable and equitable management of groundwater resources. So this project took place as the name suggests in the um, Ganges Delta. Uh, we had two cities situated with the Delta, which was Kolkata in India and Kulna in Bangladesh. And um, Around each city, we had selected two peri-urban communities to do our research and capacity building activities in. Um, what was um, a, a unique aspect about these four project sites or case studies was that they were located in the same Ganges Delta system. So similar hydrogeology, and uh, also similar culture based on their location in South Asia, but uh, 
pay, situated in different countries and therefore the institutional systems and uh, governance systems were, were unique. So that uh, makes it interesting to study from a governance perspective, which is what I do. Um, and so how were these project sites selected. So this was done actually during the phase of the proposal development. The team members had conducted some pre-scoping visits to the, the region and came up with a selection of these four communities based on various criteria that is uh, listed on the slide. So they had to be very urban in nature. They had to be dependent on groundwater there should be some evidence of contestation or conflict over the access to groundwater resources, but also promising research conditions and willingness to engage in the research over the next four years of the project. So um, to go over now the project's design. So this was a transdisciplinary project, as I mentioned, right? So on the research side, we had integrated research from three different perspectives. One is the institutional system that I focused on using different methods like institutional analysis, also game theory modeling and serious games. So that was the part that I worked on as a PhD. Then there was also a postdoc that looked at the socioeconomic system um, using the multidimensional poverty assessment tool and a groundwater modeler from uh, Bangladesh University of Engineering Technology who studied the biophysical system. And alongside in parallel was um, capacity building efforts that were led by our NGO partners on the ground in both of these uh, countries, um, which were structured using what is known as the negotiated approach. And this approach is, um, focused on bottom up um, capacity development involving communities in decision making and negotiations over local issues, but also supporting knowledge development about the problems and community empowerment. And so the idea is that these two sort of um, efforts would be happening in parallel, but that there would be a lot of synergies and um, cross fertilization between them. So we would um, provide a lot of inputs from our scientific research into the ongoing capacity building efforts. And likewise, it would serve as a source of data for our own research activities. So in that, that was the way the transdisciplinary approach was structured in the project. Um, so how did this look over time? So I, I have a, uh, a, a timeline that gives you an idea of all the different activities that were undertaken. And this is from my own research perspective. So it's focused only on the institutional research that I conducted, not for the entire project and the other researchers. But we started in October 2014, and we had a series of different stakeholder engagement activities, including um, uh, larger workshops with local uh, communities, as well as with uh, some local government um, representatives over time. But in addition to that, we also conducted more regular, less formal mango tree meetings in the village with representatives from um, the different villages. And uh, both of these activities were led by our local NGO partner, one based in Kolkata, one based in Kulna. Then, of course, I conducted my own field research, which was very participatory in nature. And so a lot of interviews and focus group discussions with uh, communities, as well as with government stakeholders, which provided some project reports that could be used um, not just by myself, but also by the other researchers. And then finally, we had these moments during the entire project where there would be research uptake. So these were the ways that the scientific research also fed into the capacity building efforts on the ground. So either in discussions about the institutional context of the problems that the community were uh, examining, discuss what kind of uh, strategies and um, actors are involved in those problems, and uh, finally, exploration of um, solution strategies to address these problems. 
So looking back on the project design and the way the research and capacity building efforts took place, I, I thought of some sort of um, key lessons. And the first one I want to share is that the problem diagnosis stage was actually a very iterative process. Like, I mean, I showed this timeline over here, but if you see that step one, which is problem identification and essentially problem diagnosis, it almost runs the entire um, sort of um, duration of the project. Um, so problem diagnosis was really an iterative process. And to give you an example, so, at the first stage of our community engagement, the community identified three key problems that uh, was affecting them. And this was the community in Peri Urban Kulna. So the first was access to safe drinking water. The second was canal encroachment and water logging. And the third was waste dumping by the city cooperation. Um, but then over time, when we started to discuss who are the actors and what are the institutions behind these problems, we got a further revision of the safe drinking water problem. Um, the first being that there was an allocation issue as to how drinking water infrastructure was being distributed in these peri-urban areas. And the second is that um, not only uh, were public providers involved, but there are also alternate uh, alternate water service providers that were quite active. So that was a sort of further refinement. And then when I conducted some field interviews um, at a later stage, that led to another revision of the, the problem. So here we found that there were actually two main scenarios to consider. One was the existing peri-urban drinking water scenario, what is happening as of now, but there was also a very important future urban drinking water scenario that was emerging because of their proximity to the city. Um, so that was the first thing to consider. The second was that, um, was, was similarly the infrastructure allocation problem, but this was quite different from the water quality problem. Um, and that was largely relating to the groundwater, the way groundwater was monitored in the region. So in this way, we could sort of further break up the, the problem into a current versus future problem, but also in terms of um, water access versus, versus water quality. And so even though this problem diagnosis can be iterative and take a lot of time, it is helpful because it identifies not just societal priorities, but also in our project help us identify capacity building needs. So we could say, um, we could sort of reflect on the fact that, okay, the community has this problem, but what they're actually lacking is um, an understanding of what institutions uh, are uh, play an important role in the problem or how to negotiate the solutions that they are considering. So then I could also adapt my research accordingly to provide those kinds of inputs into the capacity building uh, process. The second lesson that I want to highlight here is that um, the transdisciplinary projects based on my experience here was that it does require a lot of flexibility among the project team. Um, not all societal concerns can be addressed by the project team in the same way because of funding com commitments or what our funders require us to focus on, but also data availability, political sensitivity and project resources. So for example, like I mentioned, there were three issues that were identified, but our proposal that we got funding for was focused on groundwater issues. So that limited uh, the option for us to take up the other two issues, which was more surface water resource related in the similar capacity. So how did we sort of compensate for that? So with one, uh, the canal related issues, our local NGO partner helped the villagers develop a small scale management plan. And for the waste dumping issues, during one of my field visits, I investigated that in a very sort of um, um, limited way and prepared a short brief that we shared and presented to the community about how waste is managed by the Kulna City Corporation. 
Uh, and here I should say that in the end, like what we really ended up focusing on was that um, what um, drinking water um, issue in the village, because that was the one that was groundwater uh, focused entirely. Okay, then the other aspect was that, so I mentioned we have um, activities going on in two different countries, right? In Kolkata as well. Um, in Kolkata, so while the capacity building activities continued pretty well in Kulna region in Kolkata, they had to adapt the negotiation, uh, negotiated approach because of uh, political and problem sensitivity in one of the villages of Thihuria. And this was because we as a team had actually limited understanding of the socio political dynamics that were going on in the village. So for example, there was a very strong pro and anti bottled water plant lobby, uh, which made it quite difficult to do research, but also political changes during the project uh, also influenced our ability to engage with this community. And at certain points, even pose serious risks for the participants. So, even though this community also faced a safe drinking water problem, instead of exploring it in a similar way as we did in Kulna, we sort of pivoted and decided to do an arsenic testing and mapping campaign because arsenic was a big problem with drinking water in this region. And it was an issue that sort of was less sensitive than exploring, say, the bottled water dynamics of the drinking water problem. The other issue was the resource constraints. So we had four case studies, but we early on we sort of discovered that the amount of time and resources that are needed to do this entire research and capacity building in all four cases is really intensive. So we focused our efforts on two case studies instead of four. And so the transdisciplinary research um, was still done in all four case studies, but less so in two of them uh, in a less intensive way. Um, and the and similarly, two of the case studies did not have the same intensive capacity building efforts on the ground. And the other important lesson in terms of flexibility was really the need or the amount of time that was required to build relationships for conducting the project in Kolkata, it took a lot more time and it was really important that we cultivated those relationships over there because of how hierarchical it was compared to Bangladesh. Um, our NGO partner over there also had limited connections, especially at the higher decision making level. Um, and so when I would do my field visits initially, I would spend a lot of time then going and meeting people, telling them about the project, getting them on board and sort of willing to engage with us, uh, which takes away from also some research time as well. But it was really important because otherwise I, I think it would have been even more difficult uh, to do research in that context. And uh, similarly, as I mentioned, we had a, uh, a um, person who was modeling the um, the Delta system. And for him, it was very difficult to get access to groundwater data from India to build his cross-boundary hydrological uh, model because of um, data access problems and perhaps some underlying um, diplomacy uh, issues perhaps. But um, yeah, so those were the kinds of constraints that resulted from the um, the kind of relationships and networks that we had in, in both of those contexts. Um, the third lesson, which I think was extremely valuable in that project was thinking outside the box when it came to societal engagement. So we really experimented with or uh, innovative for us, innovative methods, um, various kinds of community engagement platforms and really building on the strength of existing networks um, to conduct our um, activities. So with regards to methods, we use a lot of visual and interactive methods to discuss otherwise very complex problems or very abstract con uh, concepts. So for example, social map were used in both of our villages um, and that really helped them um, during the discussions about these problems. 
And likewise, in my own research, uh, part of my role was to give them strategic um, a space to explore strategic uh, solutions. And I did this using role-playing games as a medium for discussing. Otherwise, what have, would have been very abstract concepts like strategies and values. So that was um, quite a nice sort of takeaway from the project uh, for us as researchers, but also for the people who were conducting the capacity building efforts on the ground. Um, and then also terminology is really important, right? If you're doing transdisciplinary research, people from different disciplines might have very different understandings of uh, the same kind of things. Uh, and so we created a, a glossary of key terms that was not only used by us as researchers, but also used by the local facilitators when discussing these same concepts with the community. Um, so key terms, especially technical terms relating to the groundwater system or institutional um, terminology, uh, it really helped build community awareness on what would otherwise be quite a sort of black box, vague and abstract uh, topic. And um, in this way, empowered residents in the context where it was used. And the community Oh, and then the last point was the community organization. Um, the way we sort of approach that really helped with the, our ability to engage with them over four years throughout the project. So in the Kulna case, we set up a six member community negotiation group, which would then lead the advocacy efforts on behalf of the village with local authorities. Um, this was quite balanced in gender, but what we discovered that the male voices still tended to dominate in these discussions. So that was a takeaway from um, that approach. Uh, whereas in Kolkata, we tried something similar, but it wasn't led by us. It was um, led by the local village leader. They wanted to set up um, a village water and sanitation committee, which is something that a platform that is government supported in, in India or in West Bengal, but that actually failed in reality because there was limited support from the local village leader. So in that way, we sort of didn't rely on that platform, but just organized um, our discussions with the community in a different way. So for example, when we were doing the arsenic campaign in one of the villages in um, the Kolkata region, then we made use of a very active local NGO called the Ram Krishna Mission, who was already doing some kind of groundwater testing in that region. And they had not only expertise, but also water testing facilities that we could uh, utilize in the project. Um, and likewise, we engaged an arsenic expert from a local medical college to then build awareness on arsenicosis and what that looks like in terms of a public health perspective. So that was the first uh, project that I um, that I was a part of, and hopefully that's given you some insight into how the project was set up and um, what we experienced during the project. The second one was actually a project that I was involved in during my postdoc, which is maybe has some similarities to what the Transpath project is trying to do. So it was about water transformations to sustainability in urban fringe areas. And um, the objective was to understand the transformation process that were happening in these peri-urban areas across India. Uh, with regards to access to water for both livelihoods and domestic purposes. And at the same time, identify transformation pathways to promote more sustainable development of these areas. So this project took place in three metropolitan regions of India, Pune City, Hyderabad City, and Kolkata City. And in each city, we picked two peri-urban um, sort of villages uh, as well. And um, so in total, we had six case studies for doing the research, but likewise for the um, transformation, transformative pathways part of the project, we selected one to really focus um, on the 
pathways building approaches. So those are the ones that are highlighted in the map, uh, one near Kolkata, one near Pune, and one near Hyderabad. So this project was also a bit similar in terms of design. First, we had integrated research that um, sort of covered three elements, the institutions and governance aspects, which was sort of um, the one that I focused on, uh, access to water for domestic issues, which is what um, uh, our partner at Saki Waters in Hyderabad focused on, and uh, one on water-based livelihoods, which a partner from Germany focused on in terms of research. And the idea was that we would look at um, you know, the vulnerabilities, the transformation processes, as well as adaptation that was currently happening in these uh, different peri-urban sites, but feed these into um, the adaptation pathways approaches that we would then do with local communities and local actors in the second half of the project. So, if we were going to support peri-urban transformations to adaptation pathways, we sort of looked to the pathways literature and identified some sort of common steps that are, can be found across most pathways building approaches. So obviously first you sort of start with the baseline situation, what's currently happening, then look into the future, what is the vision, um, the goals and objectives and aspirations. And here I should mention actually that we were, our goal was to build more normative pathways in these uh, contexts. So once you have that vision, then you create your scenarios and you can compare them and analyze them and then develop your pathway from uh, the current to the future um, scenarios. Um, and then, you know, fill in those details about the strategies, the tipping points, the signals, et cetera. And then finally reflect on your develop pathway schematic and what it means in terms of uh, development or uh, adaptation strategies in the future. So using that sort of basic framework, we had a plan for how we would then build these pathways with stakeholders in these three contexts. So initially we wanted to do more bottom-up pathways building. And by that we would have a, um, a, a first workshop at the local level to identify contextual needs and largely engaging local livelihood groups, spatial clubs, cluster groups, um, local panchayat or local village leaders, for example, then follow that up with a state level workshop where they would actually build the pathways using those inputs from the local workshop. And for this one, we would engage different kinds of stakeholders like government, academics, civil society, um, as well as representatives from the first workshop. And then finally, a national level workshop, which was more policy oriented um, and again, feeding uh, or utilizing the inputs from the pathways at the state level or at the previous workshop. And this approach that we initially thought about, uh, we expected it to have three kinds of outputs. The first was community ownership over the future pathways because it was community led and community based on community uh, needs. Um, the second one was that there would be a potential for adaptation pathways um, to support rural to urban transformations because we were feeding it into the policy level at the national um, arena. And um, this also gave us an opportunity to introduce an alternative uh, planning approach um, to government stakeholders on how to deal and manage with these peri-urban areas. So this was our original plan in the project for how we would do that pathways building process. But our project um, happened to be during the global pandemic. So uh, by 2020, which was around the time where we wanted to initiate our pathways building efforts, the COVID-19 crisis hit. So there was extremely high infection rates in India, as you know, there was no travel possible, no in-person workshops uh, were possible. And we didn't really know whether we could delay it and see what happens, but then maybe people are not interested in talking to us because they have other priorities naturally and uh, dealing with you know, their own crises that were unfolding in that, uh, in that country. So we had to really think about how 
what what to do now basically do we just um not do that part of the project or do we find another way and adapt the project design in order to still build pathways uh, in a transdisciplinary way so we came up with like a remote stakeholder engagement process so we said okay we cannot visit these villages and uh, virtual wo workshops were not suitable because of poor internet connection but also uh, how would we arrange like um, computers and internet access um, um, for people to connect from their villages? But we did know that there's excellent mobile coverage in India, including in these um, more remote areas. Um, so what we did was we uh, created a panel of 20 representatives from each of the three villages. And this panel, um, had representatives from the community representing both livelihood and um, water use, like domestic water users, as well as local government. And instead of doing virtual workshops, we would have telephone meetings with panel members one on one. So before each meeting, we would uh, share uh, some kind of preparatory material. So this included videos about what we were gonna discuss as well as a questionnaire telling them the kinds of questions we were gonna ask them. And we share these over WhatsApp before each um, uh, discussion round. And uh, in this way, we uh, conducted virtual iterative pathways building in um, over the course of three uh, rounds. And because we had to do this in the local languages, which were different languages in all three contexts, we hired and trained local facilitators to actually implement this on the ground. So what this new adapted pathways building approach reflects is um, one that is supported by this Delphi method. So a Delphi method is basically a forecasting method that also allows for group consensus building. And the Delphi method uses questionnaires for one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, over several rounds. And in each round, individual responses are collected from a panel. And in subsequent rounds, you share the group responses so people can um, reflect on what the group has said in the earlier round and then discuss further information or collect additional information and so on. So what we did was we took those initial six, five or six steps of the pathways and we sort of reconfigured it around this uh, Delphi method such that we could iteratively build our pathways uh, using this Delphi method in uh, um, three different rounds with our stakeholders. So I won't go into the details of this, but there is a paper that really explains the methodology if you're interested. And so based on this sort of revised um, transdisciplinary approach, our project timeline looked uh, a lot more like this. So of course, at the start of our project, we started with our site selection, you know, what peri-urban villages are we going to do these activities in? And then our problem diagnosis was uh, based on field visits by all of the researchers, um, a survey that a household survey that was also con um, conducted in each village, as well as uh, and sort of using those data inputs, uh, we then prepared for our uh, transformative pathways processes. So here, these are just the steps that we did with our Delphi panel of local actors. And um, at the same time, we also conducted a similar exercise, but very separately with experts. So people from local universities or people from um, um, government agencies, just to see if they have a very different idea about uh, transformative pathways from the three villages. But the two pathways building exercises were really separate. And today I really wanna focus on the pathways that we did with local actors only. And then finally, once the entire project was over, we had a policy level workshop where we then presented results from our pathways uh, building process and discussed it with more national level um, um, and state level representatives. So what worked in this, um, in this project and like, let's look reflect a little bit on that. So in our problem diagnosis, we really approached it 
um, as best as possible from a transdisciplinary approach. So us three researchers always visited the project sites together. We conducted all of our field research together. And that was really beneficial because it helped us identify uh, early research synergies and integration opportunities. Uh, but at the same time, it allowed us to engage with a much broader group of societal actors and be more efficient with our time. And at the same time, reduce stakeholder fatigue because then they weren't being interviewed by three different people about three different topics. We could do this in a very organized, systematic way. Um, but these regular visits to the community also contributed to this relationship building, which then proved very beneficial when it was time to then contact them to see if they wanted to be part of this um, pathways building effort later on. Then we also experimented with a variety of methods during the problem diagnosis phase, which helped us with triangulation, but also uh, was a nice way to, to discuss issues with the community. So we had, of course, the, the more normal sort of interviews, focus group discussion surveys, but we did transact walks, uh, village cluster mapping, timeline mapping, problem sketching, and guided tours. So the map at the bottom left is basically an example of a cluster map that we developed, and uh, we could really get a sense of what the uh, village uh, look like on the ground in these different cl clusters and made very short descriptions. Um, so this gave us a very rich understanding about these communities and in terms of how the villages were set up in um, with regards to governance, with regards to livelihood functions, domestic water use, transformations, uh, etc. So I think that really helped us when it came um, time to do our pathways uh, building process because we had a, a good enough awareness of what the context we were dealing with looked like. And luckily, as I mentioned, those sort of initial field visits prove really valuable later on because they provided so much useful information uh, as the basis for then building the pathways. So the problem diagnosis phase was extremely helpful because they provided inputs on the baseline situation against which we could then design or co-design normative pathways with stakeholders. So it not only gave us a geographic overview of the village, but also the transformations that were already ongoing in terms of population, in terms of infrastructure, as well as changes in household water supply, um, changes in livelihoods and what new opportunities were emerging in the village, as well as threats to the current uh, primary livelihoods and household water needs. So there is a video that you can scan and have a look at, which is um, a video explaining the baseline situation that we use in our first Delphi round. So we share this video with the local, with the, the panel of people from the communities who participated in our pathways building effort. Uh, and of course it's in the local language, but to give you a sense of how we then um, gave them a basis to then think about, okay, now this is the, my baseline. Uh, what does the future look like? Uh, look like? And the other thing that was useful about the problem diagnosis was that it helped us identify priorities for the pathways uh, building process. So one was that we learned that the uh, livelihood sector and the domestic water sector were extremely different. And so we needed to actually tackle these two sectors very diff separately during our pathways building process. So we designed, co-designed separate pathways for both sectors with the actors. Um, it also gave us a sense of what representation is needed uh, in creating this panel of um, local actors. And, um, and at the same time, the field visits uh, gave us an early indication of maybe some suitable candidates to reach out to later on. Um, and then we also knew that there were three kinds of pathways that we had to, that were important to consider. One is obviously the business as usual pathway, which is what people tended to think about at the moment in the village. Um, they also had a, a decent enough understanding of 
maybe what their preferred future is like and what their alternative future. And so likewise, we also de design pathways around those two kinds of futures. And so overall, I would summarize that the benefits from this project and the way that we designed this um, uh, project was that it allowed us to continue engaging low, uh, remote communities uh, in these um, transformative pathways um, processes. Um, the Delphi brought structure to the discussion of pathways elements. Um, the way that we organized it, uh, because it had it had one-on-one -on -one questionnaires, I, I think it overcomes some of the group dynamics that you observe when you do, say, a workshop and certain voices tend to dominate others, whereas that is removed if you have one-on-one -on -one discussions. Um, although the Delphi still allows for sharing of group responses in the next round, so that's another benefit. Uh, and so as a result, these one-on-one -on -one discussions gives a much richer picture about the pathways elements that you would get in a workshop setting, in my opinion. Um, then because it was very iterative, it also encouraged meaningful uh, reflection um, of the inputs by the other panel members. So in this way, the other actors. Uh, and comparing it with the um, the person's own perceptions and preferences. And so likewise, like the Delphi, it helped a little bit with consensus building and navigating con conflict uh, areas, but it also highlighted areas where consensus was impossible and uh, certain groups fundamentally deviated in terms of what their values were of, or what the uh, baseline situation was. So those were sort of um, some methodological as well as um, transdisciplinary insights that we gained from doing this exercise. But we also faced obviously a lot of challenges in the process. One, it proved to be very intensive. The whole process took uh, 11 months from start to finish, but that includes the time it takes to develop the methodology, train the facilitators, and then actually conduct the uh, three different rounds. And uh, because it takes so long, then it's difficult to keep participants engaged or still interested over that period of time. Some participants naturally miss face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, as did we, but really in this case, we were just forced by the pandemic to, um, to sort of go this route. Um, and at the same time, the... Um, the methodology also has a tendency to introduce certain biases like uh, any other kind of research uh, pathways building method, I guess. So one is that the longer duration of the entire exercise uh, had the benefit of disconnecting people from topical events that were going on in their communities. But at the same time, we, um, we, there was a risk that we introduce bias in the selection of our participants or by the investigators who were conducting the telephone discussions and synthesizing the data based on how they discuss the pathways elements with those um, actors. So um, another challenge was the difficulty in explaining pathways concepts over telephone, as you can imagine. Um, so one of the strategies that we adopted to uh, make it accessible was to, of course, share those videos. But likewise, here also, we provided a glossary of terms as to what we mean by each of those elements. Uh, nevertheless, it was still very difficult to discuss things like signals, for example, over the telephone. And likewise, uh, and at the end of the day, now we have these really nice pathways that represent um, transformative uh, strategies and priorities at a village level. But how do we scale that up into an actual adaptive plan? Um, this was obviously, it targeted these villages, but um, even if we compare the villages, it does offer some policy inputs, but um, which we shared in our final workshop with our policy sort of, um, uh, stakeholders, but still there are uh, projects sort of ended at the point of developing the pathways and then we didn't really have the opportunity to explore 
what comes after that? How do we either bring those insights to the decision makers or how do we act upon those insights then? So yeah, um, if you want to know more, there are a bunch of papers that were written about both of these projects that talk about the method as well as the transdisciplinary um, experiences that you can have a look at. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Charlene. Uh, very interesting. So I uh, also looking at, well, I see already a hand raised uh, by Leon. So uh, Leon, uh, please take your opportunity to ask. Oh, I, was just, I was just applauding. <laughs> but, uh, but I can also ask questions, but, but maybe let's let's see if some colleagues have some things to ask because um, I have talked about this with Charlene before in several. Yes, so maybe somebody else would like. Yes, sir. please, Nizun Kitaka. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry I, I, I joined earlier and then I, I realized that, you know, the UT, what do you call the GMT, the yeah. UTA, uh, was a bit confusing. So when I logged out, I started doing other things and I realized I had actually forgotten to join. But anyway, uh, thank you so much, uh, especially. Um, on the last uh, project which you, you are working on the transformative pathways, which is similar to what we are supposed to be doing, but uh, your approach was more on one-on-one. -on -one. So I have just a few questions. Number one, how many people did you reach in this one-on-one? -on one-on-one, -on -one? I mean, on-one-on-one uh, -on -one -on -one discussion. And secondly, at the different levels, were the same people whom you are pro who were in the first level? How many of them went to the higher levels, up to the policy making? Yeah. Uh, so that every voice can be heard. Um, and I glad I was going to ask you, wasn't this intensive? Because this sounds very intensive. <laughs> and then my last one is, uh, what do you recommend in terms of follow up? You know, once you identify these, you identify the activities, you identify the commit communities commit on what they are going to do. That's a challenge I'm actually been scratching my head. How do we follow up whether this is actually being implemented or is it only implemented when you agree and after that everybody goes and starts doing their own things? Yeah. I would like to borrow a leaf from you on what strategy have you put in place to try and monitor and see whether whatever you have agreed, because more or less, although you are doing it on one-on-one, -on -one, that is practically more or less the same systems we used on our T-Labs, mm -hmm. where you identified, you got into this level, you committed, and uh, we even reached, because even if you had uh, the same people in a workshop, we could take different groups in different the academicians, the policymakers, on a separate room, they will come up with their own policies. So by the end of the day, you had the same theme. But the question yeah. is, how do we know whether what we agreed people are doing? Because the project doesn't have the capability in terms of fun, finance to yeah. be able to follow that part. No, thank you for your question. So to answer the first one is that in each, so we did this in three different locations. And in yeah. each location, we engaged with between 15 to 20 people. So our target number for each panel was a minimum of 15 uh, and a max. Uh, sort of our maximum of 20 just to keep it manageable as well for the researchers or the facilitators. Okay. Okay. Um, the second question you asked about how the representation at the higher levels. So our initial plan was to start from the bottom and then go gradually to the higher levels. But because of the pandemic, then we couldn't do that. So because the we felt that the decision makers would simply just not, it wasn't the right time to engage them because they were so busy dealing with the pandemic. So that's why we focused only on the pathways development from a completely local perspective. So that's why that we have normative pathways that really emphasize what this com each community wants. Um, and yeah, it didn't really, what it did, okay. was not followed up with a higher level. But then that relates to your third question about what now, right? So what we did was we have these really nice pathways sketched out for three different villages um, that tell you what people want in the next 15 years for their communities. Uh, but it's a plan. 
it's a it's just sort of a nice uh, schematic of uh, what people want and possibilities for how to get there. There were some local government stakeholders that were part of these panels, um, but we did not have any discussions about how to now implement the pathways at the end of the, the pathways building process. So that for us is where the project ended. Like we developed the pathways and we discussed them with the stakeholders, but the next phase of like, okay, now should we go to the higher level decision makers and say, hey, look, you manage these peri-urban communities. This is what they want. This is how you can make them more um, sustainable in terms of de development. How can you use these inputs to also adapt your own planning approaches? That part was not really conducted in our project. And so I'm also curious as to what would be the steps to have that next discussion. Um, like, what do you need to discuss, how to discuss it, and then how to translate it into some kind of action? Probably there will be some negotiation that is needed uh, between um, the local and the higher level stakeholders. But that was really something that the project didn't engage with um, beyond developing the pathways with the communities, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, that, that helps me because that has really been something stretching. And if you really want to do this transformative, we need to see how to get to the next level just in terms mm -hmm. of monitoring. Uh, maybe I don't know whether you are aware of uh, the water, what are they normally called? Water Engineering and Development Center, which is WEDEC, okay. which, is, uh, which is a center dealing with uh, sanitation for sustainable development and emergency relief. It is actually under Loughborough University in UK. Okay. I've been involved with them several times and they normally organize uh, conferences which are purely basically looking at actions taken within those communities. And I've seen a lot of examples from India mm -hmm. uh, because I've actually organized two and this year they have one. Okay. So I could share with you the information because basically that's, it is uptake. It's more on the uptalk. Okay. And the solution and how this is based. Yes, please, it's a please. Small organization, but yeah. Even lower. yeah, I'll share. And what are they called? Sorry, water development. It's W E D C. Okay. I can just, I'll write it on the chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I, likewise, I mean, do you, yeah. there's two ways to do it. You could either like upscale it by connecting the local with the higher level or broadening the scope, right? So now you've done it for this one village. But this one village is such a small community in this larger area. So, for example, one of the villages we worked in was situated in a delta, uh, not a delta, sorry, a wetland. Um, but so this is only their um, ideas about how to manage the wetland. If you really wanted to maybe have a, a, one of the wetland management authority, for example, one of the questions they pose for us was like, okay, can we sort of scale this up to other villages within the wetland as well? And then maybe it is a, a good idea to have those discussions with policymakers to then see what inputs we can use into wetland management, for example. So I think there's different ways to go here, but uh, we didn't explore that yet. No, but thank you for the suggestion. Okay, thank you. No worries. And yes. Anamika has a question. Yeah, so there is a question of Anamika in the uh, chat. Let me read it uh, for everybody. So, but what about the village level institutions? Can they also implement some of these plans? And how about building their capacity? Will that be more sustainable? And yeah, no, so definitely one of the things that we wanted to focus on during the pathways building process was the role of institutions and different actors um, that are responsible for implementing those institutions. So there we said, okay, in a certain pathway, if these are the actions that you have to take over time, which institutions are needed for you to conduct that particular action or uh, and which actors responsible for helping you with that. So there were definitely some areas where the local government could have um, facilitated a particular action within a pathway. Uh, but overall, there was so much of the transformation process that was 
are driven by external forces. So um, largely the urbanization process or the way that the wetland was changing, for example, that was really beyond the, the scope and the capacity of the village level uh, administration. So in that way, we felt that they were also um, limited in their adaptive capacity because of things that were at a much bigger scale. Um, and so that is really the challenge is that, I, I mean, I think that if you really wanted to move away from the business as usual towards a more sustainable or preferred pathway, for example, you really need to um, get government support because local adaptive capacity was limited in facilitating a move to a particular pathway. That was largely the takeaway from the, across the three villages. I need to unmute. I saw a thumbs up in the meantime from Anamika. So thank you very much. I see a hand raised by uh, Mijo. So please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. So I just wanted to know, like, how did the local power differences play out in both of the field size? Um, in the second project or the first one? Like uh, in second project, in especially second in the project. second budget. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there were definitely power dynamics between um, obviously the communities and um, the government actors. And likewise, even within the communities, you could also see power differences between, say, for example, in one case, we had um, um, a fishing cooperative that had slightly more um, resources and uh, capacity to adapt than uh, individual private fishermen, which were much more small scale. Or in another village, then you have these power differences between, you know, people who had lived in the village a really long time and this new township that was being developed in the village. Uh, so power dynamics did exist, but I think that's one of the reasons why I think this uh, pathways building approach was was nice because instead of having a workshop with all of these actors in the same place where such like power differences might play out in the way um, the pathways were discussed, for example, you could really have uh, give each person a voice during the pathways building process um, and allow them to have share their own opinion in a very, um, like, let's say in a, uh, in a way that they also felt comfortable. So I, I wouldn't say that, yes, there are power differences, but they didn't impact the pathways building process as much because of how uh, we conducted this one-on-one -on -one in successful rounds, in yeah, successive rounds. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yes, yes. thank you. Thank you. Then um, I'm also just looking at the time and it's already past uh, hi, 4 hi. p.m. in the Netherlands. But if there are more questions, please. Uh... Hi, 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 Shalin. I hi. have one thing. Uh, yeah, hi. I actually, I can relate uh, the, with this problem that you are talking about, like the uh, difficulties of the allocations of the public drinking water infrastructure, because I am from Kolkata also oh, okay. and I stay in Jadavpur. So you can relate this because Dadapur is an area, I think you have taken the village of Tinhuria. Tinhuria, I think, yeah. is, is in the Shonarpur area. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Shonarpur and Dadapur is uh, very uh, near to each other. Each two locations are very near to each other. So in Jadapur, we already facing some difficult issues in, with the water-related crisis because most of the areas are arsenic contaminated areas. So for that, we need to buy water each and every day. So yeah. so uh, what's your suggestions regarding all this? Because power struggle, we know that each and area is definitely linked with the power struggles, power increases of powers are there, political struggle is there. So what do you suggest? Do you suggest the community involvement here or, or any yeah. other uh, large holder policy stakeholder, uh, stakeholder uh, policies like water conservation campaigns or like promotions of the water efficient practices? 
uh, both in industries as well as in the households. So what's your suggestion on this? This is one question. And mm -hmm. another thing is that I would like to know more about the gentry methodology. Yeah, so for the first question, I mean, the issue of this bottled water um, market that exists, it exists in Tihuria, it exists in not just in the Kolkata context, but also in other uh, peri-urban contexts as well. Yes, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, that is largely, at least in Tihuria, you saw in the first project, we had to sort of change our strategy there with regards to how to discuss the problem, because this bottled water um, industry was so powerful there that it, mm -hmm. it actually caused quite a lot of problems for uh, the local partners who were conducting the workshops, but also the participants who were then engaged in our project. So yes. for that reason, it, it didn't, uh, we didn't feel safe sort of putting these stakeholders in further risk, which is why we pivoted to the arsenic aspects of the, the problem. But at the same time, I think in West Bengal, there is a recognition among uh, decision makers or an awareness among decision makers that the um, bottled water industry is uh, sort of out of control. It is poorly regulated. Um, the question is, how do you go about addressing that? Yeah. That is the part that mm -hmm. um, that I don't have an answer for because that wasn't really what I so for that I think community community involvement maybe maybe uh, is a good. Uh, I want to say a good suggestion for it, community involvement. If yeah, it could enough. just be like a better regulation from the higher level because there are definitely mm. permits in place by which these um, industries have to set up, but they're not operating. So I think also better enforcement of institutions from um, different authorities, like, I don't know, the state water, the groundwater investigation department mm -hmm. or certain... There are lots of uh, researches already taking place, particularly in the Jadavpur University for the arsenic contaminations and all that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the question is the lack of uh, institutional enforcement in these areas yes. that is also allowing mm -hmm. these industries to continue. Uh, yes. And the second one about the Delphi method. So yes. in the last slide, which I'll share the slides through, through YAP, um, but in the last slide, there is a paper that goes into the details of the Delphi method, at least yeah, as it, okay. as we uh, used it in the pathways building process. So I would recommend looking at that paper for okay. more on the methodology. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank no you. Worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting question. I see also the hand raised of uh, Kuhn. So as a final question uh, for this webinar. So Kuhn, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for everyone from Vietnam. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for your presentation. I think this is a really interesting uh, study about cases. Um, I, I have uh, maybe a question related to, to the second study. Uh, when you show the, let's say, the bottom up approach, where you do from landlords and the state and then the national uh, workshop. So, um, yeah, I, I was wondering about the last one. Yeah. Uh, um, the last one, the national workshop for policy development. So my question is uh, how you translate what is your finding from the the the, the, let's say the, the local levels and then uh, come up to, to the policy? Is it like uh, the same group you discuss and then no, you find so, out the problem? And, uh, yeah. yeah. No, so... Um... Our initial plan was to have these bottom to top level uh, pathways building process, but in the end, we just focused only on the local level and built the pathways entirely from those actors' perspective. So we actually did not follow it up with any, like say, state or national level workshops. What we did do was at the end of our project, we had like a a workshop where we invited people from, not a workshop, a conference actually, on uh, peri-urban issues more generally. And we invited people from the national level and state level policy ma uh, making arenas to attend that workshop. And over there, we, we focus on um, a number of key peri-urban challenges. So that was 
water and sanitation, there could have been disasters. There's also, I think, a gender session. Uh, so there were maybe four or five different peri-urban issues that we dealt with at that conference. And then in the session on like um, the water supply, then that was the session where we presented the findings of our pathways building process from our project. And um, there the idea was not for them to build on the pathways further, but it was more so like a, an opportunity for us to build awareness on like, A, this is what is happening on the ground level because they are so disconnected from it in certain ways. And uh, B, this is like an approach that you could take to do adaptive planning because of how uncertain the future is in, in you know, in peri-urban context. So it was more like, um, introducing them to a new approach for decision-making and planning. And on the other hand, telling them about the ground level reality of what's happening across peri-urban India. But that was the only kind of higher level engagement that we did uh, through the conference. Yeah, right. Thanks so much. It's no worries. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Poon, for your final question. Thank you, uh, Charlene, for your all the answers that you have given and for your very interesting um, presentation. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I also have a question, but and I will ask it when I uh, see you in Delft, but then I was maybe realizing maybe that's not it. Maybe it needs to wait a little uh, longer um, because, well, for I think it's not a secret uh, that you are expecting a baby and that you're going on maternity leave uh, at the end of this week. Yeah. So let's take the opportunity to wish you a very healthy final weeks in your pregnancy oh, you. and an even uh, better and more healthy start of being a, a young mother for your uh, child. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. And I keep my question for another time. <laughs> um, let me then also share uh, that in four weeks from now, 15th of April, we have um, the Brahmaputta note. Um, to share and present uh, with us their research design for transformative change. Um, looking very much uh, forward to that. Um, so with that, I'm going to close this webinar. Thank you, Charlene. Thanks nice. everybody uh, for participating and your interesting questions. I found it very interesting and I would like to wish you a very nice day and see each other soon.